we really uh, hope to, to put hope in reach of, of addicts everywhere. So and these families that are looking for care, um, uh, we know that Christ is the hope. We know that uh, there is transformation. We know it's possible. And all the families that are, that are listening today that are hopeless, let me tell you, there's hope. Gene Kilborn once wrote, addiction begins with the hope that something out there can instantly fill up the emptiness inside. Today, guest speaker and director of Global Teen Challenge, Jerry Nance, joins us to talk about a hope that we can take hold of that frees us from our worst addictions. If you or someone you love is wrestling with addiction, depression, or hopelessness, check out David Wilkerson's book, Have You Felt Like Giving Up Lately?, it's available now as a free online audiobook on our website, worldchallenge.org. Before we join our guest and host, we want you to know that we would not be able to create these resources without generous listeners like you. Please consider donating to power the mission and make World Challenge resources like this devotional and podcast possible. Now here's our host, Gary Wilkerson. Well, uh, welcome to the Gary Wilkerson Podcast. I'm Gary Wilkerson, and I'm here with a good friend and a great man of God who is ministering in ways that impact the world. You're going to be excited to hear uh, what God's doing through your life. Jerry, welcome. Glad you're here on our podcast. Glad to be today. here. Absolutely. Uh, Jerry, Jerry's the director of uh, Global Teen Challenge. Uh, Jerry, you know, we have this in common. We both uh, have worked for my father, David Wilkerson, before. And yeah. uh, what we don't have in common is that I was actually born by him, and you <laughs> weren't. But we, we are brothers in Christ. And uh, uh, Jerry has been... Um, uh, working originally with World Challenge, where you worked for my father for many years, uh, helping him do his Dave Wilkerson Crusades, and then now have uh, taken on your role at Global Teen Challenge. So uh, thanks, Jerry, for coming along today. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, uh, Global Teen Challenge. What is this as an organization? Okay. Uh, Global Teen Challenge, we partner with Teen Challenge Centers all over the world to provide training and, and really developing the leadership teams as well as uh, launching new Teen Challenge programs in countries where uh, there are no programs, faith-based programs for really serving uh, the addicted population, as well as just really investing in curriculum development and translation of curriculum. So we really are doing a broad, broad uh, amount of work just in every uh, Teen Challenge Center in the world. Yeah, you, you were uh, kind enough to speak to our staff uh, this morning. You asked a question, how many of you have uh, family members or friends who are addicted? How, what would you say, 80% of the people raise their hands? Right. Is, right. That, is that normal wherever you go? If you were to ask that question, would you say? Uh, at least 75% of every crowd, if I'm ever in a church or in a, in a business setting where I'm speaking to even business communities, uh, do you have a loved one addicted to drugs or alcohol, loved one or friend? They'll all say yes, because it, it is a, an enormous issue, uh, not just across America, but truly all over the world. Yeah, and the, being that you head up a, one of the most effective and impactful uh, programs for those on addiction, you probably have a pretty good knowledge of the vast uh, breadth of addiction in, around the world today? Do you? Well, absolutely. Gary, there's uh, the United Nations, they do continual studies on on the kind of a, the uh, population of addicts and the, the numbers always are in the realm of 270 to 280 million drug abusers uh, globally. And, and the truth of it is, when you think about that, that's not even half likely the number because yeah. A lot of your shame-based culture countries, they're just not going to report, like a pa Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq. They're not going to tell you the truth about the addiction there. But one in every four adult men in Pakistan are using heroin, and, and, and most all of them addicted. So one in every four men. Mm -hmm. So you, you look at that need. And then in Afghanistan, the, the use of, of uh, and even in the wars where they're, they're keeping the soldiers stoned on heroin and drugs so that they'll go and do some of the stuff they're doing. Mm -hmm. It's an enormous problem in, in some of the Asian countries of the world, but they won't even talk about it. But I mean, like for the price of a boiled egg, you can get heroin in, in parts of China. Hmm. So, crazy. I mean, it's, yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. And India yeah. is, you know, uh, just, we believe uh, approximately 20% of all drug addicts on the face of the earth are in India. Hmm. So heroin is everywhere, and uh, they tend to smoke it. They don't tend to use it intravenously. But I've seen parks. One evening we were on the border of uh, Mumbai or Bombay, and we 
we just he's, they, they took us there the director took us there and he said just wait and it was like dust dark and there were at least 4,000 mm. drug addicts just coming to crash and s- sleep in the park because they're living in the streets they're homeless and they're helpless and I mean it just grabs your heart to mm-hmm. say that this issue drug addiction is grabbing and destroying lives destroying families mm-hmm. and uh, and the breakup of the home so often today in America it's it's drug related mm-hmm. yeah so yeah, yeah. You, you, sometimes you don't think of that you think of one in four in Pakistan for instance uh, being on heroin but you know that's one out of four families being destroyed one out of four moms crying themselves to sleep at night wondering where their little boy is uh, on, on the streets and that's mm-hmm. a so so the the ripple effect of addictions are are, are, are much wider than we, we even know. And, it, and in right. America, is it, uh, uh, would you say it's uh, less of a problem than in some other countries? Or <laughs> No, I wouldn't. There's 22 million, uh, according to government studies, 22 mm-hmm. million Americans. So wow. you consider our population of over, over 300 million. That's still a significant amount that's of people huge. that are hurting. And yeah. when you think of this opiate epidemic, that has just flooded across America. You can you can fault the the medical companies, the pharmaceutical companies. They really did push pain control and these pain clinics that have gone across America. You know, people were very innocently uh, they were playing tennis and hurt their elbow or they yeah. tore up their knee playing football. They go in and get uh, I mean a large supply of of uh, oxycotton, oxycodone. They start taking it and then they run out of pills. Well, if they start over medicating themselves because of their pain, that is highly addictive. And the next thing you know, they're looking for it. And so now the 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 crash down uh, and the clamp down on the prescriptions, mm-hmm. they're going to heroin, and they're yeah. finding it in the streets. It's coming out of Mexico. It's coming from other parts of the world, and it's it's uh, devastating. And and these are just solid people that are now devastated. Their families. And, you know, Gary, I think one of the greatest challenges is this word shame. Mm. You know, you, you don't want to tell anybody yeah. that my son, who was a, a student, was a football player, a tennis star, is now a heroin addict and mm-hmm. doing things you never, they're robbing, they're, they're breaking into people's houses, yeah. they're prostituting themselves to get these drugs, and they're embarrassed. And yeah. so they hide, and so we really... Uh, hope to to put hope in reach of mm-hmm. of addicts everywhere. So and any of these families that are looking for care, um, mm-hmm. uh, we know that Christ is the hope. Yeah. We know that uh, there is transformation. We know it's possible. And all the families that are that are listening today that are hopeless, yeah. let me tell you, there's hope. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. we see it all the time. But but America's uh, really struggling. Yeah, I definitely want to talk uh, just a little bit. When I come back to that. Talk about how somebody's listening today uh, needs hope for themselves or their family. Uh, but just, uh, I just kind of want to keep looking at the broad, sh- the brush stroke of this is you know how it's impacting, uh, particularly in America here. So, you're, what you're saying is is some of the uh, prescription drugs are a little harder to get now. So people mm-hmm. are turning to street drugs. It's yes. probably making and, and and that puts them in a whole different kind of culture then too because right. you're, now you're going to a drug dealer, uh, you're owing people money, uh, so 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 the problems are intensifying then in in some ways would that be right? Oh, absolutely. And and Gary, that's that those are the students coming into the doors of Teen Challenge. They're mm-hmm. getting so desperate. Um, the criminal activity that that results from that, they get arrested. Now they're they're getting criminal records, and they the judges are giving them choices: either go to prison or go to uh, uh, drug programs. Yeah. And Teen Challenge is one of those that that they'll choose and select to be yeah. with us. So a uh, large percentage of our adult men, I'd say 10, 15 percent, are coming through court referrals hmm. wow. into the program. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah, that's a lot. yeah, that's it a lot. is. Uh, tell us a little bit about Teen Challenge. Um, I kind of already know the story a little bit, how it started, but uh, yeah. I'd love to hear from your perspective. <laughs> I, I kind of tell the story of, uh, as, as, as I know it from uh, the early days, but uh, Teen yeah. Challenge started. It how? started, you know, uh, the David Wilkerson, your dad, uh, was pastoring at the time, and you weren't even born, right. and uh, was reading uh, in his prayer time, read a Life magazine, February 28th, 1958. If you look, uh, look at that 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 uh, magazine we have several of them in our office that we keep a keep them around and uh, because that was the starting point when he's read the story of seven boys on trial for murder in New York City and uh, God just touched his heart and said to him um, go help those boys and 19 days later he was standing in New York City had never been to New York City 
had and didn't have a clue of really what the real issues were, but God burdened his heart to go help those boys. And he made an attempt to really reach those seven boys, but that really never did happen. But while he was going into the neighborhoods, God gave him access to these gang members and favor with the gang members and and um, just began to open doors to, to really minister to them. But he found out there was one thing that, that he didn't even know about until he got in there was that they were using heroin. You got to picture the United States in 1958 mm -hmm. and think about heroin is now in the streets and kids are, are living together in burned out buildings. Well, the the moral culture was totally different then, but to think about them destroying their lives on these drugs, and your dad just decided, um, you know, felt God wanting him to help those uh, addicts, and, and that's when, uh, you know, in like 1960, he created the very first residential program mm -hmm. so that students could uh, find care and find hope and freedom from addiction, because I think early on, they were putting them in people's homes, uh, these addicts trying to get off of drugs. And it was fine in some cases, but in other cases, they might steal your TV and, right. and, and head out. Yeah. And that's very typical if they're still struggling with yeah. addiction. But your dad started with that heart and that compassion to help the hurting. And I think that that spirit, you know, you, when you talk about cultures, that culture of care, that culture of reaching out to the hopeless is still a very much a part of this culture of Teen Challenge today, 60 years later. And, and, uh, and it was that heart, that, that commitment to prayer, that birth, birth the ministry. And, and truly, that's what we're doing all over the world is going into communities where there's enormous needs. And I mean, I've been in Cambodia, I've been in Vietnam, I've been in Russia, Siberia, no matter where you're at, sir, uh, you know, uh, uh, just Czechoslovakia or the Czech Republic, Slovakia, all these countries, there's addiction everywhere. And so Teen Challenge being there provides hope and it's men and women who caught your father's vision that said that that's the right thing to do and mm -hmm. and they went out because really it organically grew from one center in Brooklyn New York folks in California then Detroit mm -hmm. and and then other cities and and then it went to the Hague Netherlands and mm -hmm. they just celebrated this past summer their 50th anniversary right. yeah. and it was incredible and, and there were there were over 600 leaders from all over the world that were there for that 50th anniversary and right. and uh, and so you realize the the culture and then from from Europe it went over into Asia and then Africa and mm -hmm. today Teen Challenge in Africa is just exploding but but it happened because of one man being faithful to hear from God and then to act out and to step out into what he felt God asked him to do. And so and now uh, how many how many uh, centers and how many nations are there now? We have over 1,500 Teen Challenge programs in 125 nations of the world. Mm -hmm. and, and Global Teen Challenge is cur currently working in 10 uh, new countries now, mm -hmm. uh, Bangladesh, uh, places like uh, Indonesia, to be able to go in and, and work in some of these countries right. to, to put hope in reach of addicts in those right. communities. And it's, it's an incredible opportunity, but an incredible need. And we realize we won't put everybody in a bed Right. So we're really working on new, innovative ways to try to reach addicts and provide care and to give them a chance to get out of that addiction. Yeah. Uh, I, I like that. That's uh, you know, the, the vision. Um, when you spe speak of putting hope within reach of every addict, uh, tell us a little bit about how that – did you did you come up with that? that yeah. That, the Lord gave yeah. That, that vision was, and how yeah. that happened and what's, what's the impact of that? Well, I was in prayer and, and reading the book of Luke and, and reading chapter 5 of Luke and, and just when Jesus – asked Peter to get into the boat and he said launch out into the deep and let down your nets into the deep they caught an enormous amount of fish and and I was just pondering that in the in the in my prayer time and and God just began to speak to me you know Jesus changed their methodology that day of how they fished because they always fished at night if you read the story there in Luke 5 Peter had said look master we fished all night that he was basically exhausted mm -hmm. and they were cleaning their nets and you know if you don't want to re-clean your nets mm -hmm. if you you know you're not going to catch any fish in the daytime was in his mind but they caught such a, a catch and and jesus changed their methodology and they caught more fish and the holy spirit just said jerry if you want to reach more addicts you're going to have to change your methodology mm -hmm. because teen challenge historic nature of our organization is 12-month residential care 
coming to the program. Stop whatever you're doing and come in and be with us and we'll disciple you, we'll help you, we'll help you restore your relationship with your family and, and with God and yourself. Forgive yourself and get over some of these things and mm-hmm. really bring restoration to your life. But that won't work for 270 million and, and beyond. So we realized we really need to look at new strategies and new ways. And, you know, I get, Gary, I think when it, what, for your listeners' sake, just let me just tell you a couple of stories. Lada, mm-hmm. a little girl from the Czech Republic, her father was an abusive alcoholic. And Lada and her little sister would come home from school and look and peek through the windows of her house to say, is dad in the kitchen? Is he in the bedroom? Is he at work? Where is he today? And would not even go into the house if he was in that room. And mm-hmm. and, and, and so they would sneak in. If he was there, they'd try to sneak through windows or whatever to their bedrooms mm-hmm. because when he when he was drunk, he was horribly mean. And Lotta said at night he would, he would uh, pick us up and put us on the kitchen table and scream and yell at us all night long mm-hmm. for like hours. Mm-hmm for her and her sister and, and just that verbal abuse from someone that's scary. Yeah. He was angry, yelling and slamming the table and it was everything about grades and good enough and couldn't and so her self esteem as a child was just destroyed. And so at eleven years old she made a choice, I'm not living here anymore. Mm-hmm. I mean, who wants an eleven year old child to be forced to make that kind of a decision? Mm-hmm. So she chooses to go onto the street. So what do you do in the Czech Republic at 11 years old to survive? Mm-hmm. She started prostituting, and of course, you, you know, plenty of people out there to take advantage of her. And somebody began to, hey, you can stay here, but you're going to work for me. And yeah. this was 17 years of that kind of life. Lung problems from standing in the cold weather prostituting. And mm-hmm. uh, we, there, we even have video footage of her standing on a... Uh, in a subway station where she's stoned on heroin so bad, she's nodding, just nodding, standing over the edge of the rails, people everywhere watching her. Nobody did a thing. Mm. And she finally falls into the tracks. And I mean, milliseconds later, this train runs right over top of her. But miraculously, God protects her. She was right smack between the middle of it. The train runs over her, and, and you're watching this. And nobody did anything to try to, to help her until the train. And then now they're wondering, is she dead? They went down there, and there she comes, just still stoned out of her head. And she said, about three weeks later, I, was, I came out of another trip to the emergency room. I had my the clothes on my back, and I was sitting on a on a park bench with a hos, another hospital bill I couldn't pay. Mm. And she said, "I saw that bus over there with these lights, and it was a Teen Challenge bus." Mm. I'm gonna start crying here because yeah. I know Lotta, and she's yeah. a wonderful lady. She she went over there and she said, uh, "I'm going home with you tonight." And they said, "No, no, you got to talk <laughs> paperwork. You got to do the process." And she said, "No, no, you don't understand. I'm going home with you tonight." They, they felt, okay. So they took her home. God radically saved her life mm. at Teen Challenge. Of course, we've heard more and more times she should be dead. Yeah. Fell, out, fell into an open elevator shaft from the fourth floor, hit the bottom. She was robbing somebody's apartment. Yeah. I mean, horrible life found Jesus. Today, she's a staff member of the program. Mm. She's leading other young ladies to Christ. And and uh, I was just with her. I paid her way to be able to get to go to the Europe conference because I wanted her to be able to be there for the 50th anniversary. And God transformed her life from hopelessness to hope. And now she's engaged to be married. And I'm like a grandfather that feels so (laughs) proud that this little girl through Teen Challenge could wow. could find life and find hope. That's amazing, wow. Our God can overcome the strongest addiction and redeem the darkest past. For those in the grip of addiction, he offers them a way to heal and live fully again. He can fill the emptiness inside each one of our hearts and his mercy is new every day. The Gary Wilkerson Podcast is brought to you by World Challenge, sound design for this episode by Mike Hallsmith. This episode was written by Rachel Schimitz. Our producer is Chris Wigington with video production by Aaron Gale. Each week, this podcast reaches thousands of listeners. This critical work is made possible by the generous contributions of individuals like you who believe in World Challenge's mission. Thank you for listening and supporting. 
Well, we hope you tune in next week to the Gary Wilkerson podcast for more encouragement in your Christian walk. Until then, do all you can to live a better life and make a better world through Jesus Christ.